Welcome to the show. I'm Peter Switzer. Thanks for joining us. On tonight's show, Berman Invest, Julia Lee and Rudy Philippek van Dyke from FN Arena will look at today's stock market sell-off and tell us why it happened and what are the stocks you should be chasing as a consequence. Then Steve Kukoulos of Market Economics will tell us why the economy looks like it's on a rebound and why house prices will not drop like doomsday merchants have been predicting. Then we'll talk to Paul Rickard about today's sell-off and why this could be a buying opportunity. And finally, we'll look at the interesting work by Advisor Ratings about what's happening to the financial advice industry given the Royal Commission's impact on the industry. That's the show. Without any further ado, let's go to Rudy Philippek van Dyke and Julia Lee. Well, at long last, it's been a bad day for the stock market, partly caused by Donald Trump. But I guess there are other reasons in there as well. To find out, let's talk to two 24-7 market watchers, people who can't live unless they're talking about stocks. Julia Lee from Berman Funds Management. Is that the correct term? Berman Invest. Berman Invest. There you go. So double, a double pointing to the fact that you've got a new fund, manage, a fund management business? Yes. And you're the, the fund manager? Yes, so okay. I'll be the chief investment officer. And, and, and by the way, what, what's the strategy going to be before we get to you, Rudy? Sorry. I mean, if you had to guess, you'd probably guess right, and that's a concentrated Australian shares fund. Based long on only you. or long, long or Long only, ASX 200, 12 to 30 stocks. Okay. Now, Rudy uh, Philippe Van Dyke, thanks for coming on the program. Still starting with F as well. <laughs> <laughs> and and I guess um, you, you haven't started your fund yet, really. But is it a matter of, only a matter of time? Well, I'm, I'm still I'm still running a model portfolio. Mm. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> and, and you're you're brilliantly rich because of it as well. Exactly. Exactly. All right. In my dreams. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, certainly there's been some very good uh, 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 funds. Uh, sorry, uh, stocks in that portfolio. We might talk about that later before we finish off. Now, Julia, why? Why is the market so worried about Trump and this 10% increase in tariffs? Look, if we have a look at what's been driving the market, there's been two key things that the market has been focused on. One is that central banks will keep rates low across the globe. Yep. And um, we saw the Federal Reserve last week dropping interest rates in the US by 25 basis points and a bit of a confused press conference there, which mm. didn't lend a lot of confidence to markets. But the second thing is, uh, is the China-US trade war. And unfortunately, that's been ramped up a notch, not only by the tariffs that uh, President Trump announced last week, uh, the 10% tariffs on about 300 billion US dollars worth of goods, but also because of the massive Chinese yuan devaluation that we saw, which came as a complete surprise to markets. And but wasn't the Chinese get even? You're going to do this to me, so we'll devalue the currency? Absolutely. And, <laughs> and, and that's the worry that we're seeing tit for tat at the moment and where it's going to stop. So concerns around global growth, the high beta areas of the market, like the tech sector lost 5% in value today, so sold off heavily. Mm, really? I think the Trump tweets and the whatever he, whatever he's trying to do with China, I think it's just a trigger. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm in the process of going through a lot of previews to the August reporting season, and, and one of the common denominators is, I mean, it's almost like investors have completely ignored uh, earnings over the past. Oh, seven, really? Seven Don't seven start months. bringing up earnings for earnings <laughs> exactly, season. Exactly, and um, yeah. and there's quite a there's quite a number of comments being made about like ooh, you sort of the, the, the general sense is that it, while investors were obviously I mean, there is there is that too much cash on the sidelines, into, in, stimulus from central bankers, a reversal from the Federal Reserve in in December January, but there's a, there's a general feeling that the the market might have run a little bit. Too much ahead of itself, yeah. okay. and and then obviously the, the worry is then, and that's what we because we shouldn't we shouldn't dis, dis, discount this. A record, two hundred and fifty companies have have warned about profits in Australia, and two hundred and fifty more than two hundred fifty now. Well, why have they been ignored? Because the shares shares going up, right? Yeah. So exactly. Just so so down. investors are basically have emphasized something else. Okay. Instead of but but I have to say. It has been a case, and probably always will be a case, of it's more about avoiding the ones that drop 
mm. more than having yeah. enough winners in your portfolio. Uh, like poor old Link copped it today again, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I missed that one. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, Down to four dollars something. Yeah. 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 Mm. There's been some huge moves today, both on the downside and the upside. Let's not forget when uh, Tell us the upside Lori's uh, yeah. spike, uh, gold, comes into <laughs> Funny favor. Funny that. <laughs> Gee, I'm glad I, I recommend to our readers to buy the ETF gold two weeks ago. I'm looking like a genius at the moment. Perfect. First time in my life I ever recommended gold. But go on. Uh, I mean, the Aussie dollar uh, price of gold in particular um, yeah. is looking very yeah. attractive. So if you've got a gold company that mines in Australia in Aussie dollar terms and is selling in US currency terms, I mean, the Aussie dollar had a 6.7 in front of it today. Yeah. So um, that's looking pretty nice for the gold miners mm. and also the exporters on the market. While shares are sold off quite heavily across the board, don't forget that lower Aussie dollar gives a kick to some of those big exporters. Okay. Should, yeah. all else being equal. Should. Should, okay. So before we, I start pushing you to give me some decent stocks for people to, to think about with the market mm. coming down, Rudy, do you think um, the, um, the Trump tariff play could actually get worse and see him put 25% on that last $300 billion and that would trigger a Wall Street big big sell-off and possibly a recession? Or do you think he'd, he'd pull out before then? Well, let me start by saying I have no information about what goes no. on inside the White House. No. But I actually think it's, it's not that unsurprising that he goes this far mm. because the fact that the share market is, has been performing so well the fact that um, despite a lot of uh, skepticism, economic data in the US are not that bad. Mm. Yeah? It depends whether you go and st- you start looking yeah, into the final mixed, detail. Mixed, but, but, but pretty good. But overall, it's okay. So that actually gives him enough confidence to go really, really hard mm. to, to basically please his core constituency mm. to prepare for the 2020 elections. Yeah. Yeah? And that is basically what is happening. So I, my, my theory is... Let me, no, let me put it in a different way. I was at a conference recently, not the ones that we were together, but another one. Mm. Yeah, and one of the fund managers on stage said, he said, most of my friends are Trump supporters. Yeah, and he said, that makes me a little bit unique. And I know you don't like it, but he said, but my friends, all of them, without exception, say, we don't notice anything. So there's, while well, well, the US obviously is yeah. noticing some impact from what the average is trying to do with China. Yeah. The Trump supporters itself, they were going like, we don't notice anything yet. Yeah. Ultimately, that's going to happen, of course. But while that's not happening, they might go, they will cheer him on. Go for it. Yeah? Yeah. And obviously, <coughs> that's exactly what he does. So the irony is, I think, long story short, if it really starts impacting on data, on businesses, um, on his constituency, on the outlook for the, for the US, I think then he might, he might think not twice, but three times before, yeah. before pushing it really, really hard. Julian, do you think he'll go all the way and really take on the, the Chinese? Look, I'm not hugely politically minded, but if I was running for presidency in November 2020, I'd try to time a China a US trade deal just before the election. So mm. at the peak of the optimism, that's when the election occurs. A if big market rebound too. Absolutely. If we mm. saw a deal now, it's a long time to the election and um, to ride that wave of optimism all the way to November, I think it's hard. So you're also, a crafty <laughs> Trump thinker, are you? <laughs> also keep in mind, you know, the Australian share market's up 21% in 2019 right. so far. Chief so yourself. let's not forget that it's been doing extremely well and corrections are a normal part of being invested in the market. Market. Okay. But okay. I'm optimistic given that next year is a presidential year and I don't think President Trump would get in if we did see a recession in the US. No, that's right. Okay, now let's go to the stocks you like with this potential sell-off. Well, I have to mention the gold miners. Yeah. Um, so the, the two gold miners that I like are Saracen as well as Evolution Mining. I mean, to give you a bit of context around that, Saracen with its Thunderbolt project, uh, the all-in sustaining cost in Aussie dollar terms is around about $900, yeah. um, which is extremely cheap compared to the Aussie dollar price of gold, which is above $2,000. So the margins are looking really nice yeah. and looking even better as um, gold prices spike up and the Aussie dollar yeah. goes down. And the other one is Evolution Mining, all-in sustaining cost around about $900. 150 Aussie dollars um, and they'll probably spike to about 1,050 this year mm. in the current financial year but still pretty attractive margins given mm. where the Aussie dollar price And given the, the Trump um, challenges to the world, 
Rudy, do you think gold is actually well positioned to keep on sneaking high? Oh, we had this argument at the yeah, conference yeah, we were just at yeah. last it's, week. It's not that straightforward, <laughs> I must say. But but anyway, I mean, um, there is a scenario thinking about that gold can move a lot higher. Mm. Um, but it is also possible that if things go really nasty, mm. um, we just have to look back at 2008. In 2008, gold did not perform. Yeah? And so, it disappointed so, but, a lot of people. Yeah. Right? You, usually during a recession, gold does well, right? Well, it didn't. It no, no, but it usually point. it does. Well, yeah. it depends. It depends what, what, what's happening elsewhere. Ultimately, the driver of gold is U.S. bond yields. Mm. And um, if they are being driven more and more into negative, in yeah. particular, uh, corrected for inflation, mm. then usually, all else being equal, gold should perform. Yeah. But it's also possible that, that we get a flight to safety in the mm. markets and then, then everyone moves into the US dollar. Mm. And that then is a headwind for gold. Mm. Yeah? I, I disagree. It might, might help Aussie, Aussie producers. You disagree. <laughs> I, just, I think physical gold would do very well in the case of a market meltdown as a flight to safety occurs because mm. I think there is a move away from the US currency. It is a reserve currency of the world mm. and it's traditional safe haven play. But I think with what's <clears> happened with quantitative easing and devaluation of currency, I think there's a greater perception of safety in gold. What will go up down is the gold miners because when you see liquidation in the market, you see liquidation across the board. Mm. And during the global financial crisis, even the gold miners went down, even though eventually with quantitative easing, gold prices did up. very well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so look, depends on what scenario you're playing at the moment, whether you're using gold as, you know, um, we're, we're in the late cycle phase of the economic boom that we've seen. Um, so you're going to hold gold for a while as part of your portfolio mm. or whether you're doing it as event risk and with right. a spike in volatility and you just think it's going to So pass. Really, really let's assume that she's wrong. What do you like instead? <laughs> now, of course, she's never wrong, but, but let's assume she is. Yeah. What do you like rather than gold? Well, uh, it's very difficult now if, if there was a... If you're look, looking for a safe haven, that's mm. a very difficult proposition. Yeah. I, mean, I have discussions with, with uh, subscribers and they, they're still, still looking for yield. Yeah? Mm. Yeah. And I'm going like, well, you're, you're a little bit late to the party here. Yeah. I mean, but I think the most intriguing thing about this reporting season is that, and this, this is now happening quite a number of reporting seasons, yeah? you have the, the, the solid quality companies that have a lot of growth and they are highly valued. Yeah? So the, 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 the instinct tells investors you should be careful for those companies. Yeah? Yet the irony is that the danger might actually lie in the other companies that have, have lagged, that appear to be cheaper, mm. and then have another 15, 20% downfall in them. And what we've seen so far this reporting season, of, and it's early days, but what we've seen so far is it's the laggards, it's the GUD Holdings, it's the Adelaide Brightons, it's the Bega, um, it's the Janus Andersons. They are the ones that have another 10, 15% downside mm. and we only had so far one one company on high PE multiples resmet and they on the day of reporting went up by five percent mm. yeah? and they obviously now still a better 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 uh, holding up value than than mm. the idol of brightons or the links or okay that. so the irony there is that we could have a multi-layered reporting season where mm. it's not so much whether you're on high PEs or not and it's not so much whether you disappoint or not either because some sectors have been bid up in the expectation that ultimately interest rates will help that sector, mm. but it's probably too early right now to mm. see that in their numbers. Before she interrupts, <laughs> just give us one stock you like then on that analysis, a brilliant analysis as always, Rudy. I still like Bepcor. Yeah. And I also have a suspicion- And that's well, a value stock too, Bepcor. Well, it went mm. up, to my surprise, mm. gives, you, gives you the idea, I don't pay that attention every second. It went up by 12% in, in July. Mm. So uh, about a time- So last time, you, last time you talked to my viewers, you gave us a good tip. Well done, yes. Rudy. Now, what's, what's wrong with what Rudy said? <laughs> no, no, just two things. Number one- Just two the, things wrong the, with what Rudy said. Um, no, no, <laughs> the scenario, wrong. there's nothing wrong with what Rudy has said. The scenario at the moment takes me back to last year. This is when the slowdown started and the correction started. Yeah, that, that lasted about three or four mm. months. So. Remember where prices were back then and don't waste a good correction because there can be an opportunity for mm. investors. And secondly, as Rudy mentioned, it's usually the leaders that keep on gaining and the laggards that continue to decrease. And I crunched the numbers from our last reporting season. The top 10 performers during a reporting season, eight of the 10 have gone up in that time with mm. an average performance of about 34%. So get on winners, you're saying? 
the bottom 10, 10 uh, in the ASX 200, only three managed gains and the average performance was negative 7% mm. as a group. Okay, I can tell you from a distance that the top 10 would have been high PEs and the bottom Absolutely. would have been low PEs. Yeah. There's another element as well, one I pointed out at the, at the conference, and those are my favorite stocks. Right. Structural growth stocks like CSL, ResMed, OEA, car sales, mm. Zeek, and you name it, yeah. technology mm. one. A lot of those stocks, like I can open up a chart for, for OEA Group, for example, mm. There are always these drawdowns in the chart, yeah. uh, almost without exception, that yeah. either happens in February or in August. Mm. Uh, but you come back to Julia's point, you come back six months later or the next reporting yeah. season, it the price is higher. Mm. Uh, so from that perspective, I would say if they disappoint, and it can be sometimes really, really minor, it mm. can be like, oh, we're not sure whether our margins will increase for the coming quarters, and it might actually lead to a sell-off. Mm. If you're smart, then that, and you're not, not on board yet, that might actually be the opportunity, a buying to get opportunity on board, you're saying. Right? Yeah. Even though they might they might sell off and they might be out of favor for a okay. whole month, two months, three months. Okay. But you come back six months later and you go like, I haven't looked, but why is the share price higher than where it was? Mm. Right? It happened exactly to, to, to ResMed early in the year. Okay, at the end of reporting season, really, I'll make you select those companies that fit that bill, all right? How's that sound? Sounds perfect. Oh, fantastic. Julia, as always, is there, is there any other stock you want to mention before we go? Uh, the the exporters yeah. um, should be doing well. So CSL is obviously a, a beneficiary in the type of environment. And the traditional ones that do benefit are stocks like Ansel as well as oh, Macquarie. Ampor and Macquarie. Yeah. Macquarie yeah. has a great ability to ad adapt to conditions in terms of the market. So its ability to be very quick um, mm. and adapt and its flexibility, I think it makes it a a winner for the long term. Comedy. McCoy doesn't report in August. Hmm. No, but the currency. The currency is yeah, okay. yeah. See, out of seek out of, out of um, have some security. Maybe yeah. you should go for stocks that do not report in August. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> I wish you could last year McCoy, yeah. Technology okay. one. Okay. Thanks guys for joining us. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Rudy Philippek Van Dyke from FN Arena. And of course Julia Lee from Berman, Berman Invest. Investment. Investments? Invest. Berman Invest. <laughs> Are we ever going to forget that? Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us on Switzer. All right, Steve, uh, Australia's economic growth, what's your outlook? Look, I think we're going through the low point about now. Obviously, we don't get the June quarter national accounts until early September, so about four or five weeks from now. And they are going to show year over year annual GDP at around about 1.5%. But remember, that is the June quarter. Here we are in August. We've got some signs of more positive news. I wouldn't be sort of doing cartwheels down the street with optimism, but with there's more positive news that perhaps the June quarter will be the low point. September quarter GDP will probably show a small pickup in growth. And by the, by the time we get to the end of 2019 and into 2020, we're probably going to see GDP growth back at two and a half, two and three quarter percent. So I'm a little bit optimistic. Exports are booming. We're doing really well on that front, even though iron was very fickle. The housing market's turning and non-mining business investment is a bit of the dark horse that I'm looking at. And actually, that's quite positive at the moment. Right. OK, so more rate cuts. A lot of people will be asking, can we expect them or do you think the Reserve Bank would love not to give us any more? Well, as they said, that uh, they'll do them if needed. It's a bit like having your fire extinguisher in the uh, in the kitchen. You use it if you need it, but hopefully you don't have a fire to put out. So they, they, they don't want to use it. They they were reluctant cutters uh, a couple of months ago, uh, and already I guess we're seeing the impact of those cuts and a couple of other things. The election result was positive for housing, and of course the relaxation of lending from the regulators has seen housing pick up. So I, I think they'd probably prefer not to cut, and that's why I think they're putting pressure on uh, the government here in Canberra to do a little bit more on uh, on infrastructure and perhaps some other policy reforms to give, give the economy that shot in the arm that it certainly needs. But um, th they will cut if they need to, but I think for now, 
with housing ticking up as the most sort of interest rate sensitive sector, I think they'll be just a bit cautious in going again. The other thing to note, and I know the June quarter real retail sales were very weak when they were published last week, but the month of June, the first full month after the election, but before the tax cuts kicked in, was actually a 0.4 for the month. Again, I'm not doing cartwheels down the street, but a little bit a little bit better news from the consumer side, which, of course, has been the biggest um, disappointment, I guess, in the economy over the last year. OK. Well, it's good to see that you're um, becoming a little bit more optimistic, mate. You know how I, how I love optimism. All right, so if we, put the, <laughs> if we put the tax cuts to the rate cuts, the fact that the election is now behind us, and that always brings negativity to the economy. Um, how problematic do you think the lending restrictions were over the last couple of years? Look, I think they were very important. Uh, and in fact, the interesting thing is that interest rates, even notwithstanding just the recent rate cuts, they were very low. You know, you could borrow money easily. Uh, sorry, you could borrow money at a cheap rate, but not easily because of these restrictions that came in place. So the only reason that we saw this really significant deceleration in credit growth which did impact on the mortgage market and house prices was the tightening in credit from our friends at APRA, sort of influenced by the RBA. So I think those changes, including the um, uh, lower uh, availability, if you like, of interest only loans was an important, moving people from interest only to principal and interest, they all had an impact. And so I guess it wasn't interest rates that were the concern or the problem driving housing weaker. It was just access to credit. And that was and that was the issue. Now that that's relaxed a tiny bit, a little bit, uh, that I guess we're going to see a bit more pick up in credit you know, once we get through to the end of 2019. One thing I want to ask you about, we, we're all worried about the trade war, but we seem to be doing OK, despite the fact we're not growing strongly. You made the point, exports are booming. Is China being nice to us while America is being horrible to the Chinese? Look, the, the, the trade war is an issue. It's very hard to know how it pans out. Obviously, uh, President Trump came out the other day and sort of confirmed that tariffs were going to be imposed. But look, we, we are running trade surpluses of around about five to six billion per month. So we're selling high volumes of our uh, iron ore in particular, LNG is now picking up at a huge rate of acceleration. Coal volumes are a little bit weaker, but the prices are still okay. So we're selling lots uh, into the global economy, particularly the Chinese, to get these monthly trade surpluses. Now, look, the, we're selling them out of necessity. I think that the Chinese still need iron ore. They still need energy. They still need sort of a lot of the things that we're lucky enough to have in the ground to export to them. So I think while... Uh, it's not out of any great favours necessarily to us. It's out of necessity that the Chinese like us as a reliable producer of high quality commodities. This trade war is still in the background as something that could really disrupt trade. And uh, uh, for the moment, the jury's out whether it's going to actually cause something near a, a hard landing rather than just a bit of a pause in this growth cycle that we're seeing. But again, like most people, I'm watching the news, watching Donald Trump's uh, tweet yeah. feed <laughs> to see whether there's going to be any escalation in these sorts of things. Because yeah, if, if, the, if the trade war does get bigger, if Trump ramps it up, if the Chinese retaliate against the US, we're collateral damage. You know, we, we want global yeah. trade to be strong as, as Australians uh, and we'll just get caught in the backwash it will impact on capital flows. It might even impact on things like our tourism and education exports, which don't forget are also doing very well. So uh, you made reference to the fact that you thought the, the worst of the housing downturn was over or, or worse that effect. Um, the ratio of household debt to GDP, uh, we are we're second highest in the world. <clears throat> How serious is it? And can something like that be macroeconomically managed so we don't end up like Spain, Ireland and the USA, which had you know, very big house price drops? Yeah, I, I, yes, we do have very high household debt in Australia. As you said, it's second highest in the world and just under uh, two times, 200% of household income. So it is very, very high. I always... Um, maybe it's a, the, little, the accounting 101 I did at uni. I always like to look at debt levels 
to see what assets are against those debt. Because is debt of, you know, 100% of income, 200% of income, high or low? I don't know. It depends what those assets are. And so there's uh, an important way to judge that. So if we look at the financial assets of us consumers, not just our debt, our assets, and we just focus on our super, bank deposits, and the value of our housing, that debt level is tiny. It's insignificant. It doesn't really matter because if we look at that, our net wealth is about seven and a half times income. So while our debt is two times income, we've got assets that are about four to five times that. So, okay, we sort of make our repayments on the on the debt that we've got. We uh, do require, I suppose, uh, an income flow to make those repayments every month. And if the banks were to tighten for some reason on our repayments, we would have a concern. We would have a problem. But for now, as we were just discussing, monetary policy is relatively easy right now. Uh, the labour market's still okay, even despite unemployment ticking up a little bit the last couple of months. Wages growth, while it's certainly not strong, is still two and a quarter percent. It's not falling. So our ability to service this mortgage and this level of household debt is pretty good. And the assets that we've got that debt against are very, very good. And if the housing sector turns up, well, then we even have lesser of a problem on the household debt yeah. uh, story. The, the critics of, um, of me in particular say, well, you know, this housing problem will cause the recession that will create the problem. But I kept coming back and saying Ireland, Spain and the USA actually yep. had a, a, not only a recession problem, but there was a financial institutional problem where banks didn't trust each other. And that seemed to be a very big reason why house prices ultimately fell. What do you say? <clears throat> Oh, yes, as you mentioned, the Spain, Ireland, uh, even the US and, and UK slash London property prices, those disasters were about a poorly regulated financial system that banks were lending to anyone willy-nilly, any amount of loan-to-valuation ratios above 100%. There were other things as well, but it was just a really slack poorly regulated banking and financial sector that caused it. And while, okay, we've um, had a tightening in banking rules since the GFC, we've now got the fallout, I suppose, that's coming. And it's already been anticipated from the Hain Royal Commission on Banking that it's, I don't know, our banks seem to be better run. Okay, they're, they're not pure. <laughs> and in fact, they've had some uh, very poor uh, cultural type issues and they've made some really horrendous and quite offensive loan decisions and fee charging and the rest of it. But at the end of the day, from a macroeconomic perspective, they're pretty well run. They're pretty prudent. They're not lending money to anybody willy-nilly. And I don't think we've got that problem that caused the Irish and the Spanish and even the US and some other European banks to basically blow up when their housing market turned down. In fact, Peter, we've also had a little bit of a test of that. Don't forget that house prices here in Sydney are minus 15% from the peak. In Melbourne, they're minus 10% from the peak. And what's been the impact on uh, bad and doubtful debts in, in our economy? Almost nothing. There's been a little creep up. So I, I'm with you on that one that our banks are well regulated, even though they've got a few internal issues to address, uh, to, to, to get back some confidence from us consumers, a little bit annoyed by what they did uh, in the findings of the Royal yeah, Commission. One last, last thing, Steve. A lot of the critics say, oh, the Reserve Bank doesn't even consider the importance of debt. Is that true? Oh, I, I, dis I disagree. If you look at Philip Lowe in particular, when he took over from Glenn Stevens, well, it's almost three years ago now, I think on the contrary, I think he's... He's been uh, a reluctant rate cutter for the reason that we've got high household debt. One of the things that he was noting, even though inflation kept coming in below the bottom of his target range, and people like me were screaming, mate, if you hit your, you're missing your inflation target, you've got to cut. He was reluctant to cut because of what he termed financial stability reasons. And if you look through his speeches, look through the quarterly statements on monetary policy that he put out, the financial stability definition was was household debt. It leaves you vulnerable, or he thought it left us vulnerable to any external shock. So he was reluctant to cut that would uh, to a point where we'd see um, housing credit pick up at a, at a rapid pace. So on the contrary, he's actually been leaning against the build-up of household debt by keeping policy tight until a couple of months ago 
with a very low CPI, signs that GDP was slipping below 2% in annual terms. That's why he trimmed rates. Uh, and he's willing to sort of say, well, hang on, we can get a little bit of uh, um, resurgence in credit growth for the sake of the economy to stop the unemployment rate getting to 5.5%. Okay, mate. Well, thanks for joining us on the program. And I, I've i said the same to Steve Keen. Uh, well, I said the opposite to Steve Keen. I said, I hope you're wrong. In your case, I hope you're right. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. I hope I'm right too. I want economic growth. I want to see our unemployment rate with a four yeah, on in front of it. See ya. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Peter. All the very best. My Thanks pleasure. for the opportunity. Bye bye. Well, as I pointed out earlier, the market is down about 1.9%. And I want to talk to Paul Rickard about why and also how he's playing the market right now. Paul, 1.9%, how come? Look, I, again, I'm a bit surprised today, Peter. I thought it would have done worse on Friday. I, th I went home on Friday thinking this has done pretty well today because yeah. uh, there's not a lot of fresh news over the weekend. Um, so, so it's Trump-related, you're saying? Well, it's yeah? Trump-related, I guess. Um, I mean, obviously, this whole trade thing is going to go on for some time, Peter. I think also you've got to be a little bit careful. Uh, today was a bank holiday. Now, that mm. doesn't mean as much as it used to. It does mean there are some of the fund managers are away from the market. It does tend to make things just a little thinner. So you always got to be a bit careful reading the market on bank holidays. Um, Ooh, as an old so, banker, you know that. As an old banker, I've said enough of them to know that it's not always the, uh, the typical flavour. But I did say to you earlier on, Peter, that... Um, the market actually looked quite positive on Friday. It should have been off more on Friday, but today we're getting a Monday. Okay. Maybe we're just a bit slow. So today. link link Trump's escalation of the trade war to commodity prices because the miners have copped it. We know on Friday we were talking about Vale's coming on mm -hmm. more supply, mm -hmm. which means that the benefits that BHP, Rio and Fortescue have picked up because of Vale's problems, that's dissipating, that, that gain. But also, and that was always was going to dissipate. I, hmm. I think the, the question was no one quite knew just how it was going to play out. Yep. We've got to remember that we've been living in an environment in the last seven months where allegedly world growth is slowing. And normally when growth slows, and we've seen the issues hmm. here in, in China, we've seen European economies in particularly marked down, lower growth in the US, yep. lower in Australia, that should be negative for commodity prices. Mm. And uh, most of the major commodity prices have actually been falling. Mm. The exception was iron ore that went up simply because of a disruption uh, because of Vale, who are the world's largest producer, they produce more than BHP or Rio. Mm. Um, you know, the tailings dam collapse and all the issues that had to do with their production began to land uh, in China. Mm. Also, you know, the Chinese government's been stimulating. So I guess as, as the trade thing plays out, iron ore is now getting back to perhaps what it should have been doing all along. Yep. It's still a mm. lot higher than it was in January, and uh, we're starting to see a bit more of that trade worry oh, yeah. come into the price. So tariffs from tr from Trump hurts the global economy going forward. Therefore, iron ore prices had another reason to go down. Part of the reason why our market was down, because those big companies are an important part of the... What percentage would they make? Of the, of well, the whole material sector makes up about 19% of our market. Mm. Against this, what we've got going on in iron ore and copper to a lesser extent, we're seeing obviously the gold. Yeah. So gold's been going up and that's been great also. So it would have been worse, the soft would have been worse. It, it would have been worse. So not all parts of the market are down, but uh, we certainly are starting to see it in BHP and Rio, and perhaps one of the biggest casualties is, mm. is Fortescue, which, look, 12 months ago, people were questioning was, a, was the stock went down to about 350, it all the way up to the, the $9. So it had a huge run yeah. up. I mm. guess you're getting some of that down. And uh, our market, as we've been saying, Peter, we, we've been struggling to buy it here for a while. Okay. That did need a sell off. I'm a bit surprised it was today, not Friday, mm. but uh, right, now, markets do funny some things. Some people watching here who think, hang on, Rio just promised a nice big fat extra dividend. You know, should I sell now and miss out on that dividend or should I hang on? What, what, do you, what would you do? Well, Rio goes ex-dividend on Thursday. It's yeah. going to be just under $3.10 Australian. That'll be fully frank. So yeah. that's worth about, to many investors, about $4.50. You'll see most of that adjust in the price sure, when it goes ex-dividend yeah. on, 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 on Thursday. But, uh, you know, the, the market was a bit mixed on its result, Peter, and we've seen more given back. Uh, in the market in the last two days yeah. than we actually have of the size of the dividend. So I think if you, look, I, I've said all along with these commodity stocks, I, I've liked them in the way up. I thought it was time to sort of do a little bit of profit taking. Mm. 
Now they've come back a little bit. I'm not so sure that this is the time to bail out, but um, mm. I don't think, they certainly haven't been in buy territory for some stage. Okay, so is there a stock you like with this? Because you haven't I, before. I haven't really struggling to find any stocks I like. But the market is starting to sell off. If so, which one would you like to get well, on? Well, I think reporting season is going to be absolutely critical yeah. because if, if you're out of favour of the market at the moment, you are so out of favour. Uh, you know, give, give you a couple of examples. Uh, Link, Adelaide, Brighton, uh, Reliance. There's some companies that have issued some earnings downgrades. They've been absolutely punished. They keep on getting punished. They mm. don't seem to want to go up. Mm. If you're out of favour, the market doesn't like you. Mm. Um, so I'm struggling to find too many stocks I actually like at the moment. Peter. So therefore, reporting season, which hots up this week, we, we've got CBA, we've got AMP, REA. There's quite a lot of well-known companies. Yeah, Transurban on Wednesday. Mm. I mean, I'm more inclined to look at the, I think, the, the top quality um, health companies in a pullback. So... Mm. Uh, companies like CSL and ResMed, I think they just can't go past those companies. They are expensive. Yeah. They'd be more on my buy list in a pullback. I think that's where you go long mm. because you keep on seeing good, good, good resilience. They keep on delivering on their earnings growth. So mm. I think they're the sort of companies you should earmark to pick up in, in a pullback. Right. Uh, I don't think the defensives, you know, the Medibanks, the Transurbans, uh, the ASXs, the Woolworths, the Sydney you, airports. You, I don't think there's a lot of value in those stocks. They've had such a run. You're I mean, calling them expensive defences. I'm calling them expensive defences. I mean, I think they're actually, there's a bit more um, risk in those stocks than people expect. They're mm. not just a lay down Mazera okay. and interest rates and yield. There's right. actually, have, they have an underlying business and you've got to worry about some of the other assumptions. I want there. one stock you'd buy with the dollar full, because like, we're at 67 something today. For me, Macquarie's, I, yeah. I like Macquarie on a lower dollar. What, what do you like on a lower dollar? Look, I, I like uh, Macquarie. Uh, I like CSL on a pullback. <laughs> I like a company like Aurora, O-R-A, which mm. is the involved in the packaging business. Yeah. It has both sort of 50% of Australia, 50% of the states. Mm. So it picks up. I think Amcor also picks up uh, mm. on those sort of things. They earn US dollars when they brought back home up yeah, as a profit. Yeah, I mean, look, whether I'd buy them today, I'm probably, I just don't think we've had much of a pullback, no. Peter. No. Um, we've had a... No. a, a a one-day move for down, it could just as easily partly correct again a little bit tomorrow, <coughs> probably because I think it's a little thin today. Mm. I haven't seen the trade data, but I'm wary about the bank holiday impact. Yep. But I think some of those stocks, um, the CSLs, the ResMeds, the Macquarie's, um, yeah, potentially the Aurora's, the Amcor's, mm. you know, the Aussie dollar is, is, is heading south again, mm. and uh, they're the stocks to start to look at um, in a pullback with the market going a bit south okay. and, and the currency going south. That's Paul Rickard, he's a star writer on the Switzer Report and also was the founding CEO of a little business called Comsec. Attending will help you make well-informed financial decisions this year and maximise your portfolio. I'm talking to Angus Woods, who is the founder and MD of Advisor Ratings. At a time when the financial advice industry is certainly under challenge, thanks to the Royal Commission. Thanks for joining us, Angus. Thank you very much, Peter. Is that true? It certainly is. There's a lot of ructions going on at the moment in the industry in general. Um, you are seeing a lot of concerned advisors mm. um, around the place looking to see what where they end up and what they do with their futures at the moment. And obviously that's going to impact consumers at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, but we are seeing a movement of advisors within the industry and out of the industry. Yeah. What are the big movements? Are they moving out of financial institutions, looking for jobs with other financial advisors? Or are some actually just leaving because of the, the threat of all the regulations they're going to Yeah, yeah, good question. That, both, actually. Um, you've seen recently 
the big four of all exited financial advice. Mm. So I think the last one was Westpac announced that it was exiting financial advice and they, a lot of them actually, a lot of the advisors within that group went to um, Viridian, which was a, a smaller boutique licensee, but they're being shopped out to other uh, licensees, smaller licensee groups. Um, and obviously CBA, ANZ and uh, uh, ANZ, CBA and Westpac have already already indicated their um, exiting advice. Mm. Um, and then with the, advi with the other advisors, you're seeing a lot of the exits happening generally across the board, particularly those advisors that are older, uh, 50 years and older. Mm. Um, and a lot of that is because of the regulation, uh, the impost of regulation that's coming down. And the education. The literature. education requirements. So um, FASIA, which is the Finances and Ethics Authority, is now, and you would know this quite well, Peter, mm. probably, yep. um, you know, they're now imposing a lot of um, imposts on advisors, um, you know, imposts that I think at the end of the day will improve advice for the outcomes of general mm. or all day, everyday Australians. But, you know, advisors now need to do an exam mm. um, over the next two years. Advisors also now need to um, do ongoing CPD training, which they didn't have to do before. Um, and they also now um, are looking to actually now need to be approved uh, with an approved degree, with, mm. a, with a qualification. Mm. Um, recently, you didn't have to actually do have to do that. So I think 60% of advisors um, are actually underqualified at the moment based on the new FASIA guidelines. Yes, right. And, and, and even, I guess, the most heavily qualified people will still have to do additional education. Correct. Every advisor is actually going Which to have I'm to do. Which I'm going to have to do as well. You are, I know. Yeah, every advisor is going to have to do some sort of bridging course yeah, yeah. to stay in the industry. Okay. The interesting thing is that the, the belief is that we needed more education when in actual fact we needed more ethical behaviour. Yes. Does that, I don't think the Royal Commission actually identified that advisors were poorly educated. No. They, yeah. they identified that they were, poorly, uh, they were poor when it comes to ethics. Yep. Yeah, no, and we're seeing that with, um, obviously, we see, that's the outcome of the Royal Commission, really, mm. with the whole um, bad advice element. Um, you know, I think every industry has its, I know we ter use the term bad yeah. eggs a lot, but... Oh, there are bad um, accountants, bad lawyers, even bad doctors and bad yeah. pharmacists, believe yeah. it or not. Well, you, you see um, in the UK, when they um, implemented a, a lot of this regulation and obviously the banning of commissions is the big one that's yeah. going to impact a lot of advisors. But you saw, um, I think, 40% of advisors leave the industry um, when they did the retail distribution review mm. in the UK. I think you're going to see something similar here in Australia. Mm. Um, and, and what, what does that they, mean? Well, you explain to to our uh, yep. viewers, what, what you mean by that? Well, they, uh, what that means is, um, so for the in the UK, they they banned they banned product commissions. Yeah. Uh, so obviously, the income that advisors earned was mostly from commissions earned from their products, mm. um, which therefore wasn't, you know, the, the cost was borne by the product as opposed to the consumer mm. or the client. Mm. Uh, now what's going to happen is a lot of these commissions, and uh, whilst they've been banned in Australia for a couple of years, the biggest one that's been released in the legislation that's just been announced is the removal of grandfathered commissions. So a lot of advisors were still earning a lot of commission off old product. Yeah. Uh, and particularly yeah. insurance policies. Yeah, I'm exactly, yeah. exactly. And so what that means now is that that banning of the commission is now going to, that income is going to have to come from somewhere. Mm. And we think that it's going most likely, as opposed to coming from the product issuer, mm. it most likely will have to come from the consumer mm. or the client. Mm. Um, and what that does is put up the cost of advice. Mm. Um, so, you know, and then, uh, you know, who does get advice in the end? Mostly it's going to be high net worths mm. um, as opposed to the mum and dad yeah. sort of retail investors. A lot of advisors would have fallen off their hammocks at Byron Bay and the Gold Coast. I would have oh, thought after that. Yeah, but yeah they, they would have, they would have. <laughs> All right, okay, so, um, in terms of um, the companies, we know the financial institutions are getting out of financial advice. What's happened to AMP? The AMP is an interesting one. Um, well, they've got their strategic review and financial announcement coming up on Thursday. Mm. Uh, so AMP, um, at the moment, you've seen overall they're, they're, they're trimming their advisor numbers drastically. Mm. So I think at their top, they were like they had three and a half thousand advisors back mm. three years ago. Mm. That's now at 2,200. Mm. So more than a sort of 50% decline in their advisor numbers. Mm. Uh, it'd be interesting to see where the whole wealth management business is going because obviously there's been a lot of talk around their buyer of last resort scheme. Yeah. Um, advisors in there who basically have a book 
of clients um, and A&P are obligated to offer them 4% um, on that sort of the, the revenue that they're incurring. Now, with the removal of grandfather commissions, with the exodus of financial advisors, where does that, and the exodus of clients from those books, mm. where does that put the liabilities of AMP mm. um, in terms of what that means for their financial results on the 8th? And then what does it mean for the future of AMP is going to be really interesting, mm. especially if clients no longer, because AMP were the brand that gave advice to every mum and dad Australian. Mm, yeah. And that's the way they position themselves. So this will be an EU really, really interesting mm. announcement come the 8th of August and how they navigate that. And I, I presume a lot of AMP financial advisors uh, now don't want to ha use the letters AMP. No, exactly. And, and yeah. so are they renaming themselves but still staying under the umbrella of... Because yeah, you need the umbrella, you, don't you? You do need the umbrella because the umbrella brings you compliance and brings you all the things that you need to do to operate well. efficiencies, mm. technology efficiencies yeah. and what have you. But you're right. But even today, I think a lot of the AMP um, advisors still just use their um, umbrella brand or their, mm. sorry, their, um, their, their, their own brand. Mm. So that might be Peter Switzer Financial Planning, mm. Proprietary Limited, mm. which... Sorry, I'm not putting you under yeah. AMP, I'm, Peter. I've been, I've been totally independent. <laughs> You're the totally independent. Board. But in terms of using yeah. their own name yeah. or their own brand, yeah. um, that's often been the case for the last few years anyway. Mm. But you're seeing it more now. They're sort of not putting the AMP brand front and centre on their websites. Okay. What's happening to the smaller financial planning companies? and then the middle size? Yeah. Who are benefiting from the fact that the Royal Commission has put the industry asunder? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, well, I'd say there's an interesting dynamic happening at the moment. So the bigger, bigger licensees or the bigger groups um, are picking up a lot of these advisors at the moment. And there's a, there's a mid-tier group, I would say, the, fee, the 10 to 100 advisor band, mm. um, which um, probably going to incur a little bit of um, oversight from ASIC over the next yeah. wee while. Mm. Um, you know, with the compliance regulations, obviously the Banking Royal Commission has got uh, a lot of recommendations around quarterly compliance reporting, information sharing to the market. Uh, those sorts of things are going to put a lot of cost uh, back into those uh, licensees. Mm. Um, and that's going to have to be borne by the advisors. And are the, have the licensees got the capital to do that? So you're finding the bigger guys uh, 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 who, are, who are quite well structured, um, are picking up a lot of the licensees. Those in the 10 to 100 band are trying to pick up advisors, but they really need to have strict processes, efficiencies in place. And then you're seeing the sub 10 licensee band who probably don't need the amount of process mm. that these other big groups have. Mm. They're, um, I guess they're peddling along. And I'll put, you know, you know, Peter, you're in that bucket in mm. terms of probably not needing the same sort of infrastructure cost base um, for, for those advisors, I think that's going to grow. Mm. But what that means is ASIC have a much more of a burden trying to manage that, that long tail of advisors mm. in mm. the sub 10 bracket. Yeah. And um, so, and I, and I presume, you know, as you pointed out earlier, advisors over 50 are just saying too hard, too I'm hard. getting out. Too hard, we're seeing that now. Um, the average age of advisors has gone down from, I think 56, 57 mm. down to 52. Mm. Um, and that's just by na by nature of uh, the advisors leaving the industry. So, and they're moving into, you know, a lot of them are moving into coaching positions or retaining their directorships and trying to bring new advisors mm. into the fold. What about the cost to the consumer, the end user? Yeah. Is the Royal Commission in, in making financial planners more honest? I guess that's the bottom line, isn't mm. it? Like, is there something wrong with financial planning? It was the level of honesty. Uh, I don't think it was as much well, some, some people probably failed in terms of getting the best possible product, but that could have been a dishonest thing as well. Yeah. Um, what's it going to mean? What is the average uh, financial plan going to cost? Well, at the moment, well, we're, we're, we're envisaging the average cost for a financial advice today ongoing is about $2,300. Mm. We think with the removal of grandfather commissions, with the cost of compliance, um, and what we've seen anecdotally and uh, from, from, our, <coughs> from the UK experience with the exit of a lot of the financial advisors, that's going to go up. Mm. And we, we, we think it's going to go north of $4,000 per year. Mm. What would normally cost $2,300 for advisors yeah. to actually 
retain their margins to operate a yeah. sustainable business. Yeah. But to charge 2300 that masks the fact that many of them were getting... Correct. Commissions, commissions and, and yeah, yeah. And, and because it, it, a lot of people do believe that financial plans have roughly charged one percent of funds under management. Yep. Is that still the case? Uh, that is that has been the case, but we think that that will go up. It it has more been more than one percent. Yeah, more than one percent. So if someone comes with a million yep. dollars, they're going to be expected to pay about ten grand for advice. Yeah. Yes. Um, for so the plan yep. would probably be cheaper, but the ongoing advice. Yeah, we've we've seen we've seen um we've seen. Uh, We've seen premiums go up. We've seen, obviously, that cost going up over the last 12 months. Yeah. People are resetting their, 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 their cost bases. Yeah. And those that, aren't, those that don't have the client base to afford it, they're exiting. Yeah. Yeah. So. It means a lot of uh, average Australians would not believe that it would cost 10%. It could cost 1% or oh, 10%. No, hey, well, that's always been the case. But also, yeah. given the level of regulation and the number of hours that go in and the cost of employing a financial planner, it's kind of understandable, isn't it? Yeah, well, we, what you're going to see is obviously there's a lot of um, technology coming through in this space, mm. a lot of technology coming through yeah. in this space, and it's really incumbent on financial advisors today is how do I implement that technology? Mm. Because how do you get the technology to then be replace you, I guess, so to speak, for the, um, the lower threshold clients and then bring them through once they become a little bit more complex yeah. um, so you can actually add value? Um, and that's what we're seeing now with a lot of financial advisors who are seeing, I guess, the writing on the wall mm. um, is how do you step back and <laughs> how do you step back when mm. you've got to go through an exam and do a new degree and what have you, but they've yeah. got to step back from their businesses and go, mm. how do we actually give advice to Australians? Yeah. This can be very challenging. It thanks is. for joining us, Angus. Thanks, for, thanks very much. Peter. Okay, that's Angus Woods from Advisor Ratings. And finally, if you've enjoyed the Switzer TV experience, please hit the like button and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Peter Switzer. Thanks for joining us. See you next week.